Okay, everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Greg Poshman. I'm the chair of the Board of County Commissioners. I want to thank you all for participating in this. This is our second meeting. Um, and I'm going to thank you all in advance for your enthusiasm, your collective brilliance, and your patience as we enter this visioning process. And I, I truly mean that. Uh, this is the first of several educational sessions and conversations. It's going to be informative. It's going to be thought-provoking and hopefully as inspiring as any other Aspen Institute seminar that we have here. Our longtime community member and an eminent technologist and, and member of the Aspen Institute board, known to many of us as Bill Joy, who, co who coined a management principle called Joy's Law back in the day that said, uh, no matter who you are, most of the smartest people work for someone else. Therefore, it's better to create an ecology that gets the community's smartest people toiling in your garden for your goals. In essence, a network of minds working together will be more powerful at solving complex problems than a small group. So, with that, in that spirit, the county commissioners convened this large group. I think there were about 122 people signed up um, because we saw, one, that your community part participation as the best way to be inclusive. We didn't want anybody to feel left out Although, uh, you know, we have a lot of diversity of opinion, um, we wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to be heard. But also, we wanted to draw on the collective wisdom, intelligence, and, and the wide field perspective of our community. We want everyone to have the benefit of the same comprehensive set of information going forward. And we're gonna discover together that the body of information we're looking at is dynamic. It's changing and growing constantly. In the last few weeks, things have changed. So we're learning new things that may affect our decisions. And what I'm hoping and I'm expecting is that we're all going to be learning this together. So we'll be learning together. And through this process, what you all come up with will inform the Board of County Commissioners' final decisions. So I'm going to introduce John Peacock, who will give you the agenda. Uh, and then some other speakers, John Bennett's coming up and our, our, our guest speaker I'm very excited to have here. And then we're going to have a panel discussion after and there'll be plenty of time for questions. Uh, to be expedient and respectful of everyone's time, we've been asking people to, inter to email questions or write them down um, so we can use this opportunity to get as many questions in as possible and, and be succinct. And, I, I, um, and in the spirit of the, the Lockheed Skunk Works, or one of these innovative think tanks that we hear about. Uh, I just want to say, welcome to the Skunk Works. Here we go. Thank you. John Peacock. Thanks, Greg. Uh, tonight, I'm just going to go over a, a few things to clarify the uh, role of the meeting as well as the agenda. Uh, tonight, we really have three main purposes uh, that, that we'll be going through. One is to uh, reinforce the roles of the advisory groups, the, the charters, and, and to continue to define the specific topics that, that each group will be working on as we go through this process. Two is to better understand the role of the FAA and what airport elements are controlled or influenced by the county and which which ones are controlled um, by, preempted by the FAA. And then we'll explore potential implications and trade-offs that are associated with um, local, our, our county decision-making uh, throughout this visioning process. We're really gonna spend the bulk of our time tonight uh, with our, our guest speaker, who's a former chief counsel of the FAA, who we will introduce here in a moment. As far as the agenda goes, um, really, everything we do um, and everything we talk about throughout this process is going to be start with safety and is going to be related to safety first. Um, tonight, we have our guest speaker, Greg Walden, who I already said is uh, our former chief counsel with the FAA, and a resource for us on how the FAA works and how they make decisions so that we understand where we as a local entity um, have more discretion and, and where we might be preempted by, by our federal partners. As we did in our last meeting in February, we will have a question and answer period tonight. 
Um, I will say that we have now received over 60 questions um, by email. So Greg has his work cut out for him. Uh, most we think are gonna be answered uh, within the slideshow and within the presentation that uh, Greg Walden's gonna do for us this evening. But we are gonna have an extended Q&A period. And what that means is um, we were going to have breakout group discussions. I think we're going to be flexible on whether we break out into our smaller groups tonight. Uh, really, we want to maximize the time that you have with the expertise we've brought uh, in tonight to, to answer your questions. And so if the questions are still going and that conversation is going strong uh, during the panel discussion, we will skip the breakouts, and we will work with our, our visioning team uh, representatives to schedule a follow-up meeting at some point in, in April to have a more robust work group discussion. But again, given the volume of questions and given the concerns that we've heard from the community in the past that there hasn't been adequate time for the community to ask questions and have those questions answered, we thought it was most important to really focus on that. So um, we'll ask for your indulgence. Uh, if the questions are, are shorter, if the question period is shorter than we expect, we'll go ahead and do our breakouts. But um, based on what we've received from, from email so far, I think we're gonna have a pretty robust conversation. Um, this effort, just as a reminder, is not to redo the processes that, that we've done before, uh, that we've done in the past, but it's really to build on them. And it's to provide an opportunity that maybe the community hasn't felt like they've had to really bring your voices to the table and for us to make any amendments to um, potential changes at the airport before we put a shovel in the ground. That's really what's important about this process and we're committed to that process. Um, one more just house cleaning issue. Um, John Ely, would you raise your hand? Please may you stand up and raise your hand. John Ely is our county attorney. John Ely was gonna make the rounds to each of the work groups because some of the questions that we got after our February 21st meeting had to do um, particularly with conflict of interest and quorum requirements. Since we may not be making it um, to that uh, portion of the agenda tonight. If you as an individual have questions about conflict of interest or quorum requirements, you can uh, try and track John Neely down and he can have that conversation with you. On the quorum, I just remind everyone that the quorum rules were set, we're public bodies, and so we're all in the fishbowl together. And the quorum rules are set to make sure that the work that we do as public bodies is transparent, that there's not smaller groups getting together and having conversations that are outside of public view um, and, and decisions being made. And so the, the quorum is three or more members of a work group at, at this point. So please, um, if you find yourselves incidentally together, talk about the great snow we're having, the great runs you've been having, whatever it is, but try and avoid this topic until we're in a publicly noticed meeting, okay? So throughout the presentation tonight, you're gonna see this icon. Um, and what that is, is as we've been collecting questions, we're gonna throw out uh, some of the questions that are representative of kind of broad groups or, or uh, types of questions that we've received by email. So when you see that, up, we're gonna be calling out those questions. Um, tonight, we're also going to have a Q&A uh, period, so if the question that you really wanted answered going into this process about the role of the FAA or the abilities of the county or local government to make decisions haven't been answered, um, please raise your hand, ask those questions. We will try and get to them. Every question that we have received by email we are committed to answering. If we do not get to it tonight, it will be answered in writing, it will be put on our webpage. Continue to send in questions. We will continue to answer them. It is the best way for us to know what your concerns are, 
what your questions are, what we have to answer going forward. So please uh, continue to send those. Those at info at asevision.com, and asevision.com is also the website where all of that information is available. So as far as the uh, February 21st meeting, there, there were a few folks um, who could not be at the February 21st meeting. I was going to ask you to raise your hand, but I won't make you do that. You know who you are. Um, if you want to do a, a rehash, if you could, uh, Melissa, could you raise your hand? You can track down Melissa. You can track down myself. You can track down anyone on the project team. We'll be happy. Uh, to, to kind of do a debrief with you, what happened on the 21st, and make sure you're aware of where information is. All of our meetings, and our meeting right now, are videotaped, and they're put on the website, so you can always go back. It, it's long, uh, it's a, about a three hour video, um, but everything that we're doing, all the materials we're producing, all the meetings we're having, are transparent, they're on our website. Also from the meeting on the 21st, um, we asked what, you know, what would you prioritize um, for, for the airport over the next 30 years? And you can see there was some definite agreement um, on, on the top and then a lot of, of mix in the middle where, where we're gonna be having a lot of conversations. Um, but really key priorities that we took away from the first meeting, safety first, safety first. Everything we do needs to uh, be related to having a safe airport. The number two priority was reliability and quality of air service. And then an emphasis on a transparent and open process that all voices will be heard. A lot of you in this room do not trust that. I understand that. I hope that by the end of this year, we will have changed your mind. Get that you don't trust it now? That's okay. We're going to stay consistent and authentic to our process, and we're going to remain transparent uh, throughout it. The other two topics that were right after these top three priorities were also very close, and they had to do with impacts of, noise, uh, impacts of any development on uh, air quality and noise for the community. And tied with that was maintaining air service. So those are also, I think, gonna play heavily in our conversations going forward. In terms of our roadmap, um, we are in our second big bubble, um, which is looking at federal preemption and FAA requirements. Um, in May, we're scheduled to talk about trends in airspace and the air service industry. A lot of the questions that came in are actually probably going to be better answered in the May meeting. What I would anticipate is that we will have some intervening meetings um, be between the big ones. So we'll probably, uh, if our question and answer goes for a long time tonight, um, we'll probably have an April meeting to bring the work groups back together. Similarly, after our airspace and air service industry presentations, it may be that the work groups need an intervening meeting. After these two big education sessions, which is to get us all on the same page, it's important we start with the same facts. We all have passions for our community, but we need to start with the same facts. Then we'll go into brainstorming the vision and refining that vision. And again, between July and September, there may be some, some intervening um, uh, meetings to, to help us get through that process. By October, we expect to be developing recommendations specifically through the visioning committee, and they're gonna be up here in just a second, clarifying roles. And we're targeting for November and, and December um, to really have a recommendation uh, going forward from this process for if and what should be happening uh, at the airport and getting that in front of the board uh, in, in December. So at this time, I would like to invite um, John Bennett up. We have um, three 
folks who are, have taken a leadership role on our, our visioning committee. We, we've euphemistically um, named them pilots, co-pilots, and navigators, but it might be more traditional um, to, to go chair and vice chair and um, um, secretary. But at any rate, um, John, John Bennett, Jackie Francis, and Meg Haynes have taken on those roles. Meg is our uh, co-pilot, and, and Jackie is our, our navigator. And I'd like to uh, give the mic to to John and invite the three of them up to speak to you for a moment. <laughs> and that too is an open, transparent process. That's good. Um, so happy vernal equinox and first day of spring, everyone. I want to touch briefly, and I will be brief, on two things, the process in this room and the opportunity before us. So first, John has already alluded to this, it's no secret that some, perhaps many in this room, are a tad bit suspicious, let's say, of the process. Um, when the commissioners first invited me to be the pilot or chair or whatever it is of, of this committee, the vision committee, which was a total and complete surprise to me, by the way. The very first question I asked was, is this process real? Is it authentic? Or have the powers that be already, in essence, made their minds up and there's a conclusion, set of conclusions sitting on a shelf somewhere? Uh, I've now asked that question of commissioners, of the county manager, and of the consultants. And I will say that their emphatic and unanimous answers have convinced me that, in, in fact, it is a real process. The commissioners have not made up their minds, uh, and they actually do want our recommendations, and they really do want to listen to those recommendations. If I didn't believe that, frankly, I would not have taken this august, highly paid position and be standing here in front of you. Um, but I'll add some hard evidence in addition to what I've heard from them directly. With a federally approved environmental assessment, uh, and, the, and the coveted FONSI, the finding of no significant impact, the BOCC does not need this public process with all the time and the expense and frankly the headache and heartache that this sort of thing involves. They could pretty much just go out and build whatever the heck they want because they've got the legal approval to do so. And I would add that most communities would do exactly that. So I wanna really thank and commend our county commissioners for hitting the pause button here and inviting the community to participate in this process and help them think through what we really want our airport to be in 30 years. Let me add from my own experience in the past as an elected official, the more agreement we can reach through this process, the more closely our commissioners will listen to us. I am absolutely certain of that. So, I would invite us to explore the issues, listen to each other, and see if we can discover any or any substantial amount of common ground. We might just surprise ourselves. And even if we don't, each group will have a minority report, so all voices are gonna get heard. Um, now let me turn to the opportunity in front of us because it's an unusual one. We have the chance to offer our county commissioners our advice and recommendations, and they have promised to listen carefully to them. We have the opportunity to think deeply about the core issues involved in airport design and to ask ourselves some really fundamental questions um, like what kind of commercial service do we actually want in 30 years? What kind of experience do we want to offer our travelers, both residents and, and visitors? What community impact should our airport have? What's appropriate? And most important to me personally, what core community values should our future airport reflect? Over 100 years ago, uh, the pioneering American architect, Louis Sullivan, coined the term form follows function. And that became the mantra, if you will, of modern design and modern architecture through most of the 20th century. Well, maybe in this process, we could rephrase that slightly and talk about vision following values. 
For if we could identify the most important community values related to our airport, then these values could inform our vision for that airport's future. And if we did that, some of those really big, hairy, important technical issues and questions might become just a tiny bit easier. So I leave you with that thought. It's something to think about. Thank you very much for being here, and thank you for being part of this uh, skunk works that uh, Greg Poshman uh, christened it as, wherever Greg is we're sitting over there. It's a great title for this. Uh, anyway, thanks very much, and I would now like to invite Meg to come up and offer her thoughts. to working with you. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Um, I'm going to start with just reminding us of all the reasons that we're here and the things that we all agree um, why we live in Aspen. And the very first question is, what are the Aspen Roaring Fork Valley attributes that do make us unique? We all know we're unique. I was speaking with Melissa Newman and John the other day and um, said, it's trite for us to say we're in, we, we are unique, isn't it? But we all know we are, as Melissa said, really unique here in Aspen. So we know and believe our uniqueness and that's why we're here today. We take pride in it, and we steadfastly strive to preserve our uniqueness. <coughs> Sorry, I have a bit of a bug. We cherish the amazing views when our airplanes land in Aspen. We get out and smell the fresh air, and that makes us say, I'm home. We now have a very unique opportunity to chart our airport's destiny, as John said, for the next 30 years. <clears throat> what are the attributes of our community? All of you know them. We cherish the lack of hustle and bustle freeways. We love our four class mountains, Mike, that beckon us to be there. We enjoy the iconic music tent music in the summer. We have unparalleled scenic hiking, walking, biking trails, and the list goes on. <clears throat> And, however, we have diverse community constituents, residents who work the robust tourist economy and service industry in the Roaring Fork Valley, full-time residents and second homeowners, philanthropic contribu contributors to our places like the AVH Hospital, very community world-class art and cultural institutions. We know we are a very diverse community and we have so much to appreciate. One of our main attributes from our various frames of reference is that we all share our airport together. So we have that in common. <clears throat> Many of us use the, in this room use the airport as our main vehicle to travel to and from the world. <clears throat> My, um, Family would probably say that goes, what goes on my tombstones is the word objectives. I'm always into specificity and what are we really trying to achieve. And in getting ready for our venture that we're going to go on, I kept saying to Melissa and John Kinney and John Peacock, what exactly are the committee's objectives? So I just want to review them with you again. The Airport Experience Working Group, who in here is on that? Hands high. Your objective, as you probably know, is to define how the airport users could immediately see and feel Aspen's unique environment. Smelling the fresh air the minute we get off the airplane. Thank you. <clears throat> the Technical Working Group, who's here on the Technical Working Group? thank you, is to distill and understand safety and operational requirements as they relate to the airport layout plan. The community character working group, which is quite a, a 
big sounding title is to collectively decide how the airport can reflect our diverse community of intelligent and often very opinionated locals, service workers, second homeowners, tourists, and guests. Who's on the character working group? And then the focus group will test and refine the complex, unique ideas and concepts that we suggest or come up with from our working groups. The overall arching airport vision committee that John spoke about will consolidate our next nine month collaborative findings into exciting, creative, and unique recommendations to the BOCC. We look forward to getting us all there. <coughs> <coughs> I would challenge us to not have a failure of our imaginations while we work toward December when we have the opportunity to make our recommendations to the county commissioners. I would instead challenge us to work deliberately, diligently, and collaboratively to devise plans that do show the world how very unique our special airport can be and is. I feel honored to have this opportunity to work with you. Look forward to it. Thank you. Okay, hi. Meg was supposed to say who I am. Can you guys hear me? I'm Jackie Francis, and I did not prepare anything, so that's kind of how I live my life. <laughs> but I um, have been in this valley in Aspen Snowmass for about 50 years, and um, don't ask me where I grew up. I've had that question before. It was here. <laughs> I'm not that old. But um, I uh, use the airport a lot. And I am a longtime local. And I also hear the planes warm up every single morning. It's how I um, think of as my alarm clock, because I am probably the closest house to the airport. And so I'm on this committee for a lot of reasons. Um, I want this to be a quality product that we can hand to the county commissioners. And my big thing on um, the slideshow tonight, I think we come to a, our next slide, I said to Melissa, I said, we need to ask ourselves, and I want you guys to all ask yourself this, why am I here tonight? Why am I here on this committee? Why am I here in this process? Because it's important that we don't think that um, our voice is worthless and that we're here just to be a fly in the ointment or to blow up the process. We have, as John said, we have an opportunity to make this process work, and we have an opportunity to make the airport a better place. So I think we need to take this opportunity seriously and ask ourselves, why am I here in this room? Why, is this, why does this matter to me? And that's what we have to go forward with. So thank you all. Well, I would like to... Uh now introduce our principal resource person and speaker uh, this evening. Um, Greg Walden is a professor of both aviation law and transportation law at George Mason University. He's a senior advisor to McGuire Woods Consulting. He's co-author of the book Aviation Law, Cases and Materials. And he is, of course, former chief counsel to the FAA. I expect that this afternoon, evening, he will answer a lot of questions from us, and I look forward to that. Welcome, Greg Walden. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I hope the slides, the next few slides, will answer a lot of your questions. I don't expect they'll answer all of your questions, and some of you may not be satisfied with some of what's up here, uh, but I'm going to try to be an honest broker here and tell you what the law is, how the FAA views the law, how the FAA uses its funding and its safety responsibilities to ensure that airports are safe and efficient. What's not on the slide, something about my experience you might want to know is that I'm a lawyer and I'm, and I'm a lobbyist, 
and I've represented a number of airports over the years, including Atlanta, Los Angeles, Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport, Bill and Hillary Clinton National Airport, uh, and Denver Airport. I've represented citizens groups in New Jersey, in Seattle, and in Louisville, and I've even represented airlines, thankfully, for just a short period of time. Some of what you'll see and what you'll hear from me tonight, you already know. I apologize for that, but our objective is to bring everyone to a level set of understanding of the law and the facts, and this presentation is intended to do that. We start with the basic principle that it's not the federal government, it's not the FAA, it is cities, counties, that decide whether there's going to be an airport in the first place, how big it's going to be, what runways it will have, what terminal it will have. Those are all local decisions. The FAA has a big role to play on ensuring that those local decisions are safe and that airfields are efficient, and the FAA can promote airport development and airport safety through funding. The Airport Improvement Program was, built, uh, was established in 1982, but the FAA has been funding airports since the 1940s. In addition to AIP funds, grant funds, that carry with it grant assurances, the two most important grant assurances of 20 plus grant assurances that an airport sponsor agrees to when it receives federal funds are to keep the airport open on fair and reasonable terms as to all classes of users and not to grant an exclusive right as to any aeronautical activity. You've perhaps heard of a passenger facility charge or a PFC. This is on your ticket, but instead of the 7.5% ticket tax that goes into the Airport and Airway Trust Fund and from which fund goes the AIP grant funds, PFC revenues are held by the airlines in escrow and used for the same type of projects, basically, uh, but they're not federal funds. They're local charges. Pitkin County, Aspen Pitkin County, has a passenger facility charge of $4.50. Pitkin County Airport, Aspen Pitkin County Airport has a Part 139 certificate. Any airport that has commercial service has to obtain that certificate from the FAA. It's going to look at, the FAA is going to look at the airfield and make sure that the design is up to standards. It will make sure that the air, uh, aircraft rescue and firefighting or ARF equipment is suitable for the size and volume of the operations at the airport. As for local control, repeating what I said briefly on our first slide, the, FAA ha the, the FAA's interface is with an airport sponsor, sometimes known as the airport proprietor. That's Aspen, Pitkin County. That's the Board of County Commissioners. But the FAA will also solicit public views directly from citizens during an, a NEPA process, an environmental review process. Other times, the FAA will look only to the airport sponsor for what the city, the county, wants to do. Whoop, other way. And the airport is, wears many hats. It's an owner, it's an operator, it's an employer, it's a permit holder, it signs agreements with air carriers and with fixed base operators and concessionaires, if there were concessionaires. It also provides for emergency response, as I was mentioning, the ARF equipment and personnel. Okay, airspace. Who controls the airspace? It's the FAA, and it is only the FAA. If, any, if you wanted to, if the airport wanted to, say, well, no, we want departures this way, or departures all going that way, that's ultimately the FAA's call. They'll listen to an airport sponsor 
that wants to change arrival or departure paths, but ultimately it's the FAA's decision. There is a Part 150 program where an airport sponsor can say, we are concerned about noise impacts, and we're gonna develop noise mitigation measures. And among the noise mitigation measures could be soundproofing homes. It also could be departure paths. But those departure paths have to be voluntary. And by voluntary, that means every operator agrees to that departure change. And even in that, ha in that instance, the FAA has to bless it from the standpoint of safety. Number of aircraft operations, an airport sponsor cannot say, we'll only have 30 an hour or 30 a day. The airport sponsor cannot say, we'll only have 100,000 employments or 200,000 employments. That is, an, that is really in a deregulated environment and the economics of the aviation industry are largely deregulated from 1978. These are decisions made by the operators. But, and it's very important, the last bullet in the second group of, of bullets, Pitkin County's airfield is a natural constraint. Pitkin, Aspen Pitkin County's terminal is a natural constraint. So, so it's not that because an airport sponsor cannot limit the number of operations or the number of passengers, that means that the number of operations is potentially unlimited. It's, that's not the case when you look at the actual airfield and terminal capacity. Aircraft types. An airport sponsor cannot say we're not going to have this particular aircraft model. Airports tried to do that when some aircraft were noisier than other aircraft. When the FAA designed stage three noise standards, well, even before three, they moved from stage one to stage two. I'm old enough to remember how loud those aircraft were. When the FAA moved from one to two and two to three, they allowed the manufacturers to hush kit the engines so that a hush kitted engine on a stage one aircraft would qualify if it met the noise metrics for stage two and the same thing for stage three. Well, some airport sponsors said, we don't think that a hush kitted stage three is as quiet as originally designed stage three and we're gonna ban that aircraft type. And the FAA said no. The FAA took the airport sponsor to court and the court sided with the FAA. Last bullet. Once again, the airport design, the terminal capacity are limiting factors. You're not going to see a 747 at Pitkin County Airport because it will not qualify from the standpoint of safety. Environmental impacts, noise and emissions. This is where airport sponsors traditionally have had a large role because the Supreme Court in the 1940s said that residents who are impacted by noise have an easement taken from the airport sponsor because the airport sponsor <laughs> decided where the airport was gonna be and how big it was gonna be. It was the airport sponsor that was held liable, inverse condemnation for adverse impacts it, it, as early as the 40s. Now what happened though, unfortunately, for some residents who wanted to protect the airport from more noise, is that in 1990, the airlines got to the Congress and said, we don't like the proliferation of local nighttime curfews. These local access restrictions are burdening our business. And Congress said, okay, We'll make a deal with you. If we put limits on local access restrictions, we're going to force you to retire your stage through aircraft within 10 years, even if its loose, useful life might be 20 or 25. That was a deal struck in 1990. And in 1990, Congress wisely did not disturb any existing curfews. Aspen, Pitkin County 
has a nighttime curfew that was grandfathered in 1990. Now, if you would like to relax that curfew, the FAA will have no problem with that. If you would like to extend it, make it more restrictive, then under that 1990 law, the airport sponsor must go to the FAA and seek approval of that new restriction. And as the slide indicates, there have been 40 or 45 attempts in 28 years, and the FAA has not approved a single access restriction on stage three aircraft. Is the curfew set in stone as close as it could be? Not only in 1990 did Congress explicitly grandfather pre-existing curfews, but in 1994, through the good works of Aspen County, Aspen Pitton County airport officials and the county attorney, Congress looked at Aspen Pitton County and said, well, we want better pilot training. But in that same 1994 law, Congress said, the curfew is fine so long as it's not discriminatory. And there was something in the curfew that was the FAA had found objectionable. The airport changed it, and in 1994, Congress again, looking specifically at Aspen Pitkin County Airport, said that curfew is fine. Emissions, local airport sponsors can, can obviously regulate emissions of road or surface vehicles, make them electric, uh, but they can't deal with the emissions of aircraft. Just like, and I should have brought that up, stage four is not that different than stage three. If you wanted, if the airport wanted to say, well, there's, we want to make the aircraft quieter, something higher than stage four, lower decibel, that would be preempted. The FAA sets those design standards uh, at the source with aircraft engines. The airport sponsor, just as it decides whether to have an airport and where to put it, also decides whether it's going to have one, three, or six runways. Denver Airport has six, and they have enough land to go to 12 runways without buying anybody's property. Now look at this Aspen Pitkin County Airport. You think you could have two runways? Are you gonna blow a mountain or two to do it? No, and the FAA's not gonna require you and the FAA's not even gonna suggest that you do something that is impractical or impossible or prohibitively expensive. Now having said that, the FAA will look at an airfield and will characterize it with a design group for airplanes that can safely take off and land. And that is the design group three that the FAA has determined for Aspen Pitkin County Airport. But in doing that, the FAA realized that Aspen Pitkin County Airport, not now, complies with all of the design requirements in design group three. And so as a consequence, Aspen Pitton County Airport is a non-standard design group three airport. More on that later. When you get to the airfield, you're away from the airspace, you're not talking about aircraft types, and you look at the airfield, apart from runways and taxiways, it's the airport sponsor that dictates the size of a terminal, the number of gates, number of places, the size of the apron where airplanes park or maybe remain overnight. An airport layout plan is something an airport sponsor must maintain and keep up to date. And an airport layout plan, an ALP, must not only show current structures, runways, taxiways, airfields, FBO, other buildings, but also what is planned and projected. And when an airport wants to make a change that requires a change in the airport layout plan, the FAA needs to do at least some sort of environmental review 
which could result in an environmental assessment. I've talked about the design requirements the FAA puts on airfields. They also put them on terminals and aprons, de-icing facilities and fueling. They're all subject to FAA safety standards. And they're all safety standards, and some of those safety standards also deal with efficiency, efficiencies on the airport. Fixed base operators, you remember one of the grant assurances I talked about earlier was no exclusive right. So there are airports where a would-be fixed base operator, it would be FBO, applies to serve as a second or third or fourth FBO. And the FAA has ruled in the past that an airport sponsor must accommodate a second or a third or a fourth FBO with one exception. That is where adding another FBO would be impractical, unnecessary, and would cause some of the airfield to be lost, either some of the leasehold of the existing FBO or some other part of the airfield. In those situations, the FAA is not going to force an airport to have a second FBO. Very fact specific. Hangers also up to the local sponsor. The terminal itself is subject to the grant assurances also, so that if there were a vendor that was in the terminal, well, the airport would have to have a reasonable set of standards and fees for those charges to ensure the airport is self-sustaining. That Those system of rates and charges are not simply parking fees, but they're landing fees uh, and other uh, fees and charges. These grant assurances, the two most important, again, is keeping an airport open on fair and reasonable terms for all classes of users and the no exclusive rights prohibition, they ordinarily last for 20 years. That's 20 years after you receive grant funds. Some airports want to be free of all federal strings, and they say, we're not going to take any grant money, and they wait their 20 years. Santa Monica did that. Santa Monica didn't succeed. Why? Because some of the land on Santa Monica Airport was acquired with federal funds, and as to property acquired with federal funds, those grant assurances last as long as the airport is the airport. And most of Aspen Pitkin County Airport was, required, was acquired with federal funds. And if I sound like a broken record, I think it's important to keep on emphasizing the point that there is so much local control that will dictate the growth and size of an airport. If there is not sufficient gates, if there's not sufficient terminal capacity, if the parking facility is not big enough, the FAA will not force the airport to expand parking, expand the terminal, add hangars, lengthen runways, no. That is still a local sponsor decision. An airport might want to do it to attract service. Airport doesn't need to do it under federal law. The Airport Improvement Program generally is nationwide above $3.2 billion a year. But there are many mouths to feed. And large hub airports can generate so much money from passenger facility charges because they have so many millions of emplanements that the FAA says, we're not going to give the big grants to the big airports. We're going to use that AIP program for the smaller airports that cannot generate a lot of revenue from PFCs. But still, that money is limited. It's finite. And if Congress, when Congress actually passes a law each year to appropriate funds, they put that amount, and I think it's 3.45 billion, I think, for fiscal uh, 20 that's in the budget, and, or 
something around that for fiscal 19. But because the, air, the FAA funds all these airports, it doesn't mean that everything that Aspen Pitkin County wants in terms of an improvement, that is a safety improvement that the airport is going to get. Even if these projects are eligible, they still have to compete with other projects. And when the FAA looks and prioritizes airport improvement program projects, at the top always is a safety improvement. Security improvements, capacity improvements are second and third. Noise mitigation, sure, sure. Terminal development is at the bottom of the FAA's list. It isn't at the bottom of airport wants, but when the FAA is looking at that, those finite grant funds, they will focus on safety improvements and the extent to which they fund other lower priority items may in fact depend on whether the airport sponsor is a good corporate, a good airport citizen in terms of having a safe and safer airfield. The segment from the FA order quoted below, it's actually paraphrased, reads that where an airport is a non-standard airport, and my guess is over 100 of the 500 or so certificated airports have non-standard airfields in one or more respects. Pitkin County is not by itself in having a non-standard Design Group 3 airfield. The FAA says when we're giving out our limited, our finite airport improvement grant funds, we'll want that airport to bring it into itself into compliance with the design standards or we're going to approve a modification. The situation right now is you have modifications approved by the FAA and the question is are you going to move from those modifications and improve the safety of the airfield. The runway length is, is fine. There's no need to extend the runway length to meet any design group three standard. But in two significant respects, and they're significant to the FAA, Aspen Pitton County's airfield is not standard for design group, group three aircraft. And one of them is the runway is 100 feet wide instead of being 100 feet wide. And the other is the distance between the taxiway and the runway should be 400 feet and it's not. You can see up there the design group three requirements. Landed weight or landing weight is a very complicated metric and my understanding is it's not motivating the FAA in terms of safety improvements the way the runway taxiway separation and the runway width is. But let's go to the top of the slide, or I should say, because there's only one taxiway, because there are only a few gates those are going to be limiting factors. And aircraft manufacturers are not going to design an aircraft unless it's going to make money for them. And air carriers will not operate them unless it's going to make money for them. Those are indeed limiting factors that will, that will operate, I think, here at this airport. I don't want anyone to look at these, this slide right here and say, oh, two options, go or no go, and that's the end of it. It is not the end of it. If the decision is made to upgrade to design group three standards, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to upgrade to all design group three standards, but it likely means that the taxiway runway separation and the runway width will be extended and improved. 
As for the size of the terminal, the number of gates, the apron area, those are decisions that are within the airport sponsor's responsibility. And so I don't want to leave this discussion with if this, when this binary decision is made, that's, that's the end of it. It's not the end of it. It's, in a sense, the start of it. But I want to tell you from my perspective, and this is not a hard and fast legal conclusion, but based on my experience, if the decision is to stay with the status quo, the FAA is not likely to look kindly on a request to fund a portion of any terminal improvement. And the FAA might even try to claw back grants given to the airport that were given to keep it up with Design Group 3 standards. Will the FAA move the airfield to Design Group 2? I think this is a, would be a very aggressive action for the FAA to take. I'm not going to rule it out, but it's not an airport sponsor decision. It's the FAA's view on a non-standard airfield, and if it, it, sets, it wants to commit to improving the non-standard airfield in terms of safety, and the airport sponsor says, no, we're going to say just the way we are, I don't see federal funding, and I don't know what else the FAA might, might attempt to do. But status quo, <laughs> design group three with modifications, may also have an adverse impact on airline service. I'm not the expert on, on reading that crystal ball, uh, but that is a possibility. If I can leave you with one thought, if the commitment is made to upgrade design group three, solve, improve the safety of the airfield. The airfield is not unsafe, it's not unsafe. But to improve the safety of the airfield, a margin of safety, that doesn't dictate growth. There is so much at Aspen Pitten County Airport that are so many limiting factors. Limiting factors not only uh, to manufacturers, but, but also to air carriers and other uh, aircraft operators. That there is still so much that can be done to keep the airport as the citizens and the community wants the airport to be. So I know that these, this slide, whoops, this slide, that slide, and that slide. Admittedly, I leave the, this is what the law is, and, and as I said, this is what I think the FA would do, based on my experience. So that is um, my presentation. We will answer questions. Uh, I don't know if we're taking a break right now or, or going on to questions, but I appreciate your time and, and your patience and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you. Uh, as you noticed on the slide, there were some questions on each corner of the slide. So I think we're going to just, before we break, go back and take a look at some of those questions. All right, I'm going to start, I think, on um, the very first one, which is airspace. And these came in via text message or on the email. Um, so the first question is down here. Are we considering United's acquisition of CRJ55 uh, that would serve Aspen within standards with the airport improvements. Is that? Yeah, I, I don't know that that's within my, my bailiwick. I would just say that, that the, 
that the safety improvements are the FAA's judgment on the design requirements and moving up to safety standards is done without regard to what that means for service with a particular type of aircraft. That's not what's motivating the FAA. The airport sponsor still has some uh, power and responsibility as explained in the slides. Okay, great. All right, next one is environmental impacts. Um, is, we talked about the curfew a little bit, but maybe we could go in more detail here. Is the Pickens County Airport curfew set in stone or, or would we lose our curfew? I think we mentioned that, but just to be yeah, clear. You're, you're not gonna lose it. You, it's reflected in a general law in 1990 and a specific Aspen Pitkin County Airport law in uh, 1994. Okay, as it relates to funding considerations, um, can we speak to the modifications of standards in the role for funding for both commercial and gener general aviation? Yeah, and I, I, I apologize to everyone for not recognizing that I should be answering those as well when I'm making no, my no presentation, but uh, yes, the FAA is going to fund modifications that improve the safety of an airport, improve the efficiency of the airport. They're not necessarily going to look in terms of classes of users, favoring one, disfavoring another. Uh, they'll look because uh, John Travolta flies a 707. In Lexington, where I re represented Bluegrass Farm uh, in Kentucky, and they had one big runway of 6,700 feet and another smaller crosswind runway. A 747, no, yes, because all that was on the 747 was an Arab sheik and horses. So they're looking at, they're not looking, the FA's lens is through safety it's not actually who is on the plane and what the purpose of the flight is. And I think one thing that's unique about the funding is it's eligible for 90%, which is sort of unlike other federal agencies like the FTA, where you know if you had a, a transportation project, it's likely not to get funded at 90%. All right, will the approach minimums uh, for commercial use be the same or lower or higher with the new, with the proposed new runway improvements. So we're talking about the approach, the safety around that. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, offer that others on our panel later could better answer that question. Okay, great. I think I, did I get all those, Melissa? I think I've got all the slides. Okay, so just a little bit of housekeeping. We're gonna take a 15 minute break. There are some cookies and water, and then we're gonna come back and do a Q&A panel discussion. I just wanna take a little bit of a temperature of the room. How many people have questions tonight? And if all of you raise your hand, that's absolutely fine. Okay, so I'd say about half the room have questions. Great, great, we, um, we'll get into that in the next 15 minutes. So please take a break, and then we'll come back with the panel and the Q&A. Well, thank you everybody for um, convening back for our Clear the Air panel. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kathleen Vonatovich. I'm on the communications team for the project uh, with Kim Lee Horn. And uh, let's just go down our panel here and make the introductions, and then I'm gonna go over ground rules and format and I have this huge stack of paper here that's about over 60 questions that um, we'll try to. I don't know if we will, but we'll get through a lot of them tonight. Um, and I also just want to take a minute and thank the, the Vision Committee for those opening comments. that I, I took some notes down, and that really inspired me um, about concepts about a quality product, um, vision before values, and really taking this seriously. So thank you for setting that tone for today's discussion. All right, um, Mike Herman, he is with Kimley Horn. He is our lead project manager for the airport um, program here. Everybody knows um, our county manager. And Greg Walden, we, no introduction there. And our uh, airport leader there, airport director, John Kenny. All right, 
So, um, some ground rules. If you could stand up to ask your question, and Pat Bingham, our community relations director, is on this side, and Rich Englehart uh, with the county is on this side. So, the reason why we'd like you to stand up uh, is that we, this is recorded, and we've had a lot of people watch the video from the last meeting, and we would love for you to um, really speak closely into the mic, say your name, which airport advisory committee you're on, and then your question. And really try to frame your question in, in, as a question um, and not a, a, a dialogue and a, and a long narrative because we have this great time together with um, this great resource um, team here and we wanna get through as many questions as possible. Um, let's see. Let's start um, over here on this side. So are there a couple people that would like to uh, ask a question? I see Bob's hand here. So, um, and John McBride, Bob, and I'll get to everybody. So um, let's start with Bob in the back here, and then we'll go right up here to the front next, okay? So if you could say your name and your group that you're in and your specific question for the evening. Bob Circus, Nomez Village. I'm on the uh, Community Character Committee, and my question has to do with if we allow larger planes um, onto the airport, um, are they capable of landing under more adverse conditions than the current CRJs so as to reduce the number of diverted flights, delays, and cancellations? Thank you. Um, so we're, we're a little bit talking about um, reliability, safety and reliability. Let's see, I'm gonna, Mike, I'm gonna give this one to you. So I'm gonna start by saying a little bit of the answer to this is gonna be more explored in the May meeting. We're gonna talk a lot about um, aircraft trends and we're gonna bring in an expert on, on that and airspace, so a combination of, you asked minimums and things like that, and we're gonna talk in more depth at that point in time. Um, and I, I think that's probably the right answer at this point in time, rather than try to get into, can, can newer aircraft uh, fly more precise procedures? The answer is yes, as avionics improve, that, that continues to happen. But the procedures need to be in place. It's a very, very complicated answer, that, and one that it deserves more expertise and more time than, frankly, a quick answer from me now. Okay, uh, you were next over here. George Johnson, I'm on the technical committee. It's really a follow-up question to this. Um, Greg, specifically, um, does the FAA certify planes under the worst conditions? For example, um, arguably Aspen's the most dangerous commercial airport in the United States. Let's assume a plane flies in, uh, does a touch landing, loses an engine, full capacity, tailwind, high temperature, high humidity, all the worst possible scenarios, plus having on this aborted landing, having to make it escape route out, which is also pretty, pretty precarious. Okay, there was a lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> there are several questions there, so I, I, I'm not sure that, we're, that we've got them all, but um, the question around the Aspen Airport being the most unsafe airport is, it, there's really no data to back that up. The Aspen Airport is a very safe airport, and they do um, a lot of work to make sure that airport is safe. So the first question I think you asked is uh, about the Certified, certified FAA certified. and certification. Good question. The FAA will look to a manufacturer, and if the manufacturer says, I want this aircraft to perform, then the FAA will certificate that aircraft to that level of performance. There are some aircraft, by their design, cannot operate except for a runway that is over 9,000, 10,000 feet, or and there are other aircraft. It, again, it's a decision that a manufacturer's working probably with the air carriers and say, oh, we're developing this. We want to market for it, but it's going to have these limitations, or it's not going to have these limitations. It's ultimately up to the manufacturer. The FAA will then determine the, the uh, design requirements um, for that performance profile. Okay, did that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> one part of it. Um, how about this side of the room? Do we have a question from this side of the room? Okay, who's got the microphone? Miles? If you could stand up and say your name and your group that you're in. Hi, Evan Marks, Focus. Um, based on the presentation today, it seems like the decision to maintain status quo would be a fraught decision. Could you tell us what the possible implications to the airport would be if ASE were reduced in stature to design group two? Um, I'll, I'll thank you for the question, and I'll start um, um, by saying that uh, if the safety improvements that the FAA is recommending are not made, then I think federal funding will dry up at, at, uh, at the airport. With respect to whether there are service implications, uh, you have to look out 5, 10, 15 years at what aircraft are operating currently, what are what, are, what aircraft models are being designed and, f and what uh, capabilities. And I think that there, if aircraft are being retired after u being used for 10, 15, 20 years and the air carrier says we're not going to operate that aircraft anymore, well then that aircraft may disappear from Aspen Pitton County Airport, but that would not be the decision, that would be the Aspen, that would be the uh, air carrier's decision. Uh, so it's, it's not clear what effect there will be to the level of service. Uh, my guess, and I want to open up to others, my guess is that the level of service is likely to, to uh, decline uh, with, with those non-standard conditions still in place. Any other comments? You would also uh, lose some of the larger corporate aviation that serve the airport today, because uh, the wingspan would go from today's maximum of 95 feet down to below 79 feet. So there'd be a variety of aircraft that could not come in to, uh, tomorrow that serve the airport today. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna read one question that just came off the hot off the press here. Um, uh, is there any info on noise levels, emissions, and fuel efficiency of aircraft over the past 20 years? So. I guess kind of look, taking a look at aircraft in terms of um, information on noise levels, emissions, um, and I think today's focus, uh, uh, maybe we want to talk a little bit about the studies that are out there, but today's focus, we really want to um, at, at first kind of get to questions that are more related to FAA and regulatory issues. Um, so that one we might put on, on pause here. But go ahead. I'll, I'll, st I'll start because uh, um, the noise standards the FAA sets are with engine noise at the source. Um, as for uh, the community's interest in minimizing noise, um, you've got your nighttime curfew in place, and if you were to try to take another action to reduce the noise impact by banning a certain type of aircraft, as I said, that is not going to pass muster with the FAA. That, uh, that effort would be uh, would fail in the courts if it was challenged. Okay, uh, Rich, going back to you, you've got the microphone. A actually, okay. Kathleen, Sorry, just uh, one more thing too that um, we can bring to the table uh, in May, uh, which, where we'll be addressing some of the technology questions. But Picking County is also unique, uh, the Aspen Picking County Airport, and having an ongoing. Um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, study as well as ongoing noise studies uh, which do have longitudinal data by aircraft and aircraft type particularly on on, on the noise uh, data um, that can be compared against the information that's being collected on new aircraft okay um, I, I'm just gonna add to that because this next question goes along with what you're just saying um, how how do existing aircrafts compare to the likely future aircraft in these categories? <laughs> May question. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I mean, seriously, I mean, we, again, you could make a generalization, um, but we are bringing in a woman who's talking to aircraft manufacturers routinely, knows what they're telling, what they're telling uh, her and uh, what they're telling the airlines in terms of the, what they see as the, the, at least the immediate future, the next five and 10 years. What's out 20 and 30? That's, that becomes very speculative. 
Okay, great. Uh, Rich, he's going to take three people right here. These two gentlemen right here, if you could stand up and say your name. Hi, uh, Allie Mallory. I'm on the technical committee. Uh, Greg, this probably goes to you for, a, uh, for an answer. Um, and it really deals with the issue of trying to demystify the public's understanding of the balance between commercial aviation landings and takeoffs and uh, general aviation takeoff and landing. Uh, in, one, in your handout, you talked about uh, airspace controlled only by the FAA. Uh, and not the county, and specifically mentioned that the under number of aircraft operations airport may not impose artificial limits on airlines, operations, and passengers. Market, market conditions are the key. Uh, then you put in parentheses, entry is deregulated. Can you elaborate on that? What does all that mean to us? Because when there's only so much airspace up there, and we've seen this happen in the past where uh, there's been a reservation system for uh, general aviation to land. Uh, with that, is that still allowed under some of our grandfather arrangements? Uh, I think that would be helpful for all of us. Well, you st we start with the grant assurances um, and that, that Aspen, Pitkin County Airport must keep its airport open to all classes of users. Uh, that doesn't mean that everyone gets the same the, the same treatment in the sense that if if an aircraft requires a certain amount of time to land or take off and another aircraft doesn't require as much uh, that's that's just the nature of the uh, of of the aircraft the airspace is again the FAA's domain but if an aircraft is not does not want to enter into holding a circling pattern because there's too much going on in the airfield and they can't land that is going to be a disincentive for an airline or for business aviation to come into this airfield. When it gets capacity constrained, as it is with regard to parking, with uh, parking, auto parking, aircraft parking, it becomes less, less desirous. Air traffic control will say, we'll just handle it. <laughs> we'll handle them. You add another 50, you add another 500, we'll handle them. But how do they handle them? Diversion, holding, circling, that's not satisfactory, uh, but that's, that w is what might happen. Okay. And I uh, think the other part might be prioritization between commercial and GA. Yeah, on prioritization, uh, I think that there, if everyone is getting an opportunity, that if an airport says, well, air carriers are, are carrying 70 passengers versus general aviation that's carrying one or two, and all other things being equal, we're going to allow that air care operation not to be delayed in its arrival. That, there, that's nothing, that's not discriminatory. That, that, is, that is, I think, what airports, uh, small airports, large airports, make those decisions every day. So simply put, we can't discriminate. <laughs> it says unjust discrimination. You, you, if there's a differentiation that's based on safety or efficiency, yes, but not, uh, not an artificial uh, determination because you favor air carriers or you favor business aviation or you favor general aviation. Okay. And um, there's a gentleman right can, behind Can I just oh, ask a question, yeah. just a follow-up question? Is that ATC, is that air traffic controls oh, call yes. or is it the local call? As far as the prioritization between commercial GA who lands? What are you going to say? He's asking about airborne inventory. It is, <laughs> it's, if the airport says, well, no, I, I would, I still think it's air traffic control that makes the decision on that. I, I, I don't, their, their safety, if you say, well, it's not a question of safety, it's a question of efficiency, still the FA's uh, ball game. Okay, great. Um, there's a gentleman right behind Howie Mallory. He was next. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm Roger Nicholson. I'm on the Vision Committee. Um, this is probably not FAA related, but um, I'm curious as to airline schedules. If we go to larger aircraft, and instead of, let's say, a 95 or 75 passenger plane disgorging its uh, passengers, we now have maybe 130. Is any regard given to the fact that Highway 82 is a parking lot 
for about four hours a day, particularly in the morning for about eight to 10 going into Aspen. I visualize a large plane coming in, packed, and all of a sudden, where do the people go? Um, that's a good question. I, I, we had that discussion kind of in, uh, internally earlier, and I, it, maybe, Mike, this might be coming to you, or... or here, I'm not sure if it's I'll, I'll Mike, start and then Mike. dish to my uh, yeah. to my right here, but I I think uh, you know we're really focused as a community. We've been focused on the aircraft, but I think what we're really worried about is exactly what you're asking: is the number of people. And you know, I might ask Greg just to to revisit the the conversation about gates. You know, currently we're operating um, with seven gates. Um, it, it may be that um, as the aircraft mix, if that changes in the future, that needs to be part of um, this group's considerations and making recommendations about um, design and capacity. Um, if we want to maintain and you in fact have larger aircraft, uh, it, it may mean that um, we consider the number of gates and such that would best serve this community. And I think that's what I heard in Greg's presentation. Yes. That's right, correct. And you mentioned um, the, the question about Highway 82 and the traffic. There, there are actually several questions that came in related to transportation, traffic, Highway 82 in relation to this project. So um, I'm not sure if that's Mike or, you know, can we speak to just a little bit about how transportation, traffic, mobility would play into taking a look at any airport improvements. Um, I, obviously, part of the designing the airport is looking at the ground, the, the, the land side, the transportation network that leaves the airport. That parking is an element of that and controls elements of that. Uh, how much uh, rental car uh, opportunities there are, how good of a connection we make to transit, and how much we encourage that use it all feeds into it. Uh, out of this whole process, there will be a, a projection of, okay, what does this mean in terms of traffic, in, in terms of slug loads? The, the terminal will be designed around the number of people that are coming in at a given time. Um, and then from there, you look at the transportation network and look at how that, what, what that impact will be. And also in the EA process, um, uh, John Kenny, maybe you can weigh in here. And the EA process, we took a look at a lot of that as well. Actually, the environmental assessment uh, stopped at the perimeter of the, the airport. It did not go off the airport. And part of that reason is that every airport has such a unique and different layout. At what point would it stop going off the airport? So they draw a hard line, the FAA, in terms of what aspect you study. Roger, it's a good question, and, and I realize it's, it's, it's peaking on Highway 82, but it's also peaking inside the airport. So you could have four scheduled flights, but with the delays and the cancellations and then them all coming in at once, uh, there was many times in the last few weeks we had 8, 9, 10, 11, up to 12 uh, aircraft simultaneously happening. It eventually works its way out, but you definitely have a critical mass of infrastructure design and all the reason we're trying to roll into the transit component uh, to encourage the public transportation, which is just a vital key to a release valve for those peaks that we have at the airport. So complicated question, but one we'll definitely be getting into here in the coming, coming meetings. Uh, Rich, just right behind you, this gentleman right behind you is next. And then Stan, did you have your hand up? Stan, you'll be next. I'm Tom Kurtz. I'm on the uh, Experience Working Committee. I have two questions. One about the environmental impact. Uh, runways take a tremendous amount of cement. It's like 12 or 18 inches thick. And to build a totally new runway would be th thermally in a cement plant creating a tremendous amount of energy requirement. Is there any way to use the existing runway and expanding upon that instead of doing a totally new runway. And the second would be, uh, are we going to have a major airport manager such as Denver Airport Manager Kim Day come and advise us about her friendly look at the Aspen Airport as the close, closest hub? I'll, I'll take on the, uh, the runway pavement one and ho hopefully somebody else will talk about Kim Day. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, that's why I looked that way. Um, relative to the runway, we, I mean, we've just started to look at what the options are, but clearly um, reutilizing as much as possible that's out there is gonna make sense. There's a whole condition assessment of the existing pavement. Um, there is a life cycle analysis that's required. And so even though the runway may be in the exact same place as you see it today, based on its condition and its life cycle, you still may have to do a lot of, of replacement. We're not to the point of knowing exactly what we can do, but we are certainly looking at options that include utilizing the runway to the maximum extent possible, and certainly not, not, not spending money where we don't need to spend money, and also obviously not impacting the environment for all the reasons you pointed out. As far as bringing in additional resources, um, it's something that we had confer with our vision committee leadership on as to, to whether that would be you know, beneficial in, in terms of information. One of the things that I've learned in my short time uh, working with, with the airports and, and traveling around and visiting is uh, every airport director says the same thing. If you've seen one airport, you've seen one airport. Um, and that there's really unique aspects um, and challenges that we have here in Pitkin County um, that, that may, or, may or may not be transferable in, in terms of bringing somebody else in um, from, from another airport to speak to us about our community. Okay, we'll, well we've, we've heard that, yeah, yeah okay. thanks Tom. Uh, Stan was next. And then we're, we're they're going to go to you. So I think just because we only have one mic, maybe who have you know sort of head toward the mic if, you, if I've, I've pointed on you. So you're you're the next gentleman after Stan, and then and then going back in the back there. Okay. Thanks, Stan Clausen, Vision Committee. I'd like to revisit two questions to get a little bit more concrete answer. The first is prioritization. There are ten. It's morning. There are ten planes lined up. One's an American and United, RJ, and there are eight private planes of varying sizes. Is it possible for some authority within the airport to advance the RJs over the uh, general aviation flights? That's the first question. The second question deals with certification. I thought I heard, uh, and I might be wrong about this, that if, the, if a manufacturer wants to certify a plane for a use at our airport, the FAA will, cert will grant that certification, um, it sounded like almost automatically. And my, my question is, you know, under, under the MAX 8 issue, um, we, would, we would probably want to know that there'd be more oversight. I'll address the uh, first question. We've met extensively with the Federal Aviation Administration, including the FAA Command Center out of Herndon, Virginia. We had a variety of issues where the corporate aviation simply outnumbered the scheduled service. The airline's perspective was the airline's schedule three to four months in advance. So if the FAA's policy, which they reiterated to us numerous times, is first come, first serve, the airline's perspective is we put a stake in the ground four months earlier, where in many cases, not all, but in many cases, corporate and general aviation is it's like an Uber, a Lyft, it's on demand, it's, it's the last minute, it's inbound, here we come. So you also look at then the number of people being served by scheduled service versus corporate aviation. The aircraft are just configured to seat a lot more people. So if the benefit to the system, you would think they would give the priority over to scheduled service. But again, they come back to first come, first serve. Um, Greg has shared some things with us that gives us a little bit of maybe the, just a crack in the door there that we could go back and revisit with the FAA because we are such a constrained facility. There are times where folks are trying to get here from the East Coast. They've been up since 2 to 3 o'clock local time. They get here. They're in a holding pattern. They have to hold for so long. The aircraft is diverted to go back and get fuel only to get back up in the sky and get back into line and not still be able to get into the airport because the number of jets inside the pattern or inside the actual uh, airspace inventory. So it could be a very, very difficult, challenging experience for folks coming to the airport, something we'd really like to revisit with the FAA. So uh, more to come on that. Uh, I, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to clarify what I said about certificate in an aircraft. Uh, there, I learned just this week that 
there are some aircraft that have been modified in design solely so they could operate out of Aspen Pitkin County Airport. But that's the exception that proves the rule that when a manufacturer's building an aircraft, they're not building an aircraft necessarily for Aspen Pitkin County Airport. They want to make it as safe uh, and design it in a way that can operate at many airfields. And I don't know that a manufacturer would have a desire to, to um, operate at, at any airfield, no matter how small or how, how constrained. But in, this, in your unique environment, uh, that actually has happened with one manufacturer. Okay, I'm gonna jump to this gentleman's question and if you could just ask one question per person, that'd be great. I will ask just one question. <laughs> Thanks, it's just hard to try. <laughs> I'm Barry Vaughn, I'm on the focus group. Uh, this is maybe for John Kinney and maybe this is a veiled suggestion, I don't know, but maybe you could give us a sort of summary answer on this. A lot of the questions that have been put forward today seem to have to do more with operations and how does it actually work as opposed to legal constraints and federal preemption. Uh, in terms of like how the tower actually operates, in terms of giving priority or not to flights that are handed over from Denver Center, VFR as opposed to IFR, in terms of like deciding who gets to land first and whether there's any uh, back, whether there's any give consideration given by the tower to ramp congestion when they're clearing planes to land, and then vice versa when they're taking off whether there's priority given to the carriers as opposed to G4s waiting to uh, take off from the FBO. Just can you give us a sort of dis summary description now, if you don't have that already in the works for say May 7th or another date with somebody from the tower as to how that actually works? Yeah, I would, I'd really like to defer that to, uh, to a later meeting and the only reason is they'll come in and talk about how the local control tower basically does a five mile radius you go to an in-route center where it's about 250 mile radius. You go to a TRACOM, which is a smaller area, about 25 to 40 miles before they go into the airports. So it's a very orchestrated system and they're handed off all along the way to different in-route centers from Dallas flight coming into Denver. Well, actually, Dallas will go up to the Kansas City. Kansas City will go into the Denver center and then they'll talk them to our particular uh, tower. The tower, even though it's very, very, very Paquita, very small up there, um, you were shocked at the size of the airport, or size of the tower. You weren't sure you'd seen one that small before. It has quite the sophisticated system, so they actually are running a terminal radar approach out of that tower in addition to a normal tower. So it has kind of a dual function, which you don't see at a lot of airports, which is an added safety feature. But I think the FAA coming and talking about that would do a much better job. Uh, there's ground holds, there's ground stops, which are metering and flow control into and out of the airport. There's coordinations with the f local fixed base operator and they'll call and say, how many more parking spaces do you have? We have five more. What type of jets are they? Well, we can fit six of those if it's that type of airborne inventory by aircraft type. They'll actually get down to that granular level of a conversation, which is at most airports, y you just don't do things uh, to that granular of a level trying to f finish, uh, uh, fill that last parking spot. So the FAA really should tell that story. It's, it's a pretty unique one. Um, but as Greg said, the airspace and the air traffic control is exclusively the FAA. And there's a reason. It's very sophisticated, very complicated, and they ensure the greatest degree of safety. Uh, John Kenny, I'm just asking, as an operator, um, what, what, is your, what is your relationship and role with that air traffic con tower? I mean, how do, you, how do you interact with that on a day-to-day -day basis, 365, 24-7 operation? So there's basically four groups that we'll deal with, with within the FAA. There's air traffic control, which is the 800-pound gorilla inside the agency. There's the airports division, completely different set of rules. It's where we get our grants, our certification, a variety of other things of how we operate and develop the airport. There's airway facilities that takes care of the navigation aid, aids. So there's a variety of, of lighting systems and navigation systems that get the aircraft into and out of the airport safely. Uh, there's the certification of pilots and aircraft and, and the accident component. So there's those four different safety branches and we deal with mostly air traffic control. There's the Office of Chief Counsel too. Oh, okay. That's right, that's right, that's right. 
the umbrella chief counsel. Okay. But it's um, those agencies that we deal with on, uh, really on a, almost a daily basis to, to operate the airport. Uh, this gentleman in the back with the hat, he was next, and then uh, right next to him, the gentleman in the gingham shirts after him. Uh, Amos Underwood. And then I'll come over here to this group over here, so you guys get ready. I'm Richard, with the focus Richard group. Richard, coming to you. Uh, I had a question about one of your slides. You mentioned that um, if uh, status quo is remaining, the FAA may recoup costs. How much has been spent so far? How much has been sent so, so far on this vision process, or no? How I think on the stage two to stage three. Okay. It was in the slide that was on the that you'd put up earlier. Are you talking about aircraft noise stage two? No, the grant money is the grant money that may be. Yeah, you said that the, the FAA. You know, if we if we remain status quo, the FAA may ask for money back. I'm just curious how much money is uh, that about on the table. Uh, about three point two million dollars so far on the environmental assessment. Uh, you're about uh, a million four in the next few months associated with uh, this visioning process. Um, we have a, uh, a verbal agreement for $20 million for a new terminal building. Uh, we're doing, what is the, what is the, uh, air, what's the air carrier ramp coming at? You opened the bids the other day, just shout it out. Lots, so of point, lots of money, lots of money. 1.5 million? 2.1 million. Okay. Um, and Chris, if you're out there, I think we're spending on an average about a million and a half in grants on an, a on an annualized basis that we get through the PFC, so. Um, and is that largely for capital improvement projects? So, but we may need to go back farther, Greg, maybe, do we have a sense, you know, we, we make these grant assurances for 20 years, and I think maybe the number you're after is how far back does the clawback go on those grants, and, and what did we spend, and we probably would have to go back and obviously do some homework, but do you, do we know that? Well, I'll take an extreme example. Uh, if you want to shut down your airport, they're going to ask for every single penny back with interest. And they'll probably go into court, but if uh, not you, but I mean because well, Santa Monica, you know, and, and there are other airports where the, the 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 county or the city wants to get rid of the airport, but there's so much money that's gone, it's it's not a, a legitimate proposition. I'm I'm not prepared to say that in addition to clawing back the environmental assessment, some of these other uh, expenditures, they're gonna go back in time, one, two, three years for some of the other grant funds that have come in. But it's, it's possible, uh, it, whether it's probable, it's, it's anybody's guess. But, they have, but they, have that, they have that legal authority to go back and say, okay, well, you're, you, we gave you these grants on these understandings, now it's different and we want the money back. Okay, uh, Rich, this gentleman here, and then we're gonna go over here to Richard. Hey, uh, this question, my name's Thomas Kosich. Good evening, gentlemen, it's for John Kinney. Uh, John, ironically, this morning I was on a flight in and I read your comments in the paper regarding the overcrowding on several times this winter and your concerns that the airlines need to quote unquote space flight, flights apart, think about reducing the number of flights. I would ask you as a business traveler that comes in and out of there multiple times every week, this is a good problem we have. Uh, a lot of people wish, a community our size, wish they had these problems to be able to go to all the locations nonstop. And I really think that let's work around this. Let's remember we should be very grateful for the service we have because it's amazing where you can go nonstop here. And it really worries me when I see comments like that, that the airlines need to start thinking about reducing schedules. We don't want to reduce schedules. We want to learn to manage the schedules better. We're very, and one more thing, John, as you know better than anyone, there's a reason these airlines are flying here. The yield rate on our flights are among the top five to six routes in the country each and every year. These are specialized people that are coming here, who for the most part have lots of money and money's no object. Let's not kill the golden goose. Let's, uh, let's work around it, let's make it better. My first and foremost priority always, and will never waver, is the safety of you folks coming into and out of that facility. And when it gets to an unsafe level, we will dial it back. We're there. I've been in situations where terminals are evacuated 
it is beyond scary. And then when we get people in there with small children on the floor uh, and you do evacuation, it will not be a pretty day for the next months in the newspaper and the brand that Aspen's brand will take in terms of on a world stage could be very, very concerning, I would think. But you're also exactly right because I said it in my opening remarks last month, air service, we shouldn't take it for granted or the resiliency of it because there are airports who have pushed back on the airlines and pushed them out for a variety of reasons, mostly noise and uh, driven, and they left in droves and didn't come back for decades. So it really is a balance, but they do need to flatten out their schedule or we'll just simply start metering people into the terminal building and they'll be standing at curbside before they can get into the ticketing. We were minutes, less than five minutes away from doing that on several occasions uh, over the holiday period. It just becomes unsafe when you exceed fire code and that's kind of the, the balance that we're at. So I understand that it, we do have a very envious situation. There's no doubt about it. A lot of airports our size are begging for the problems that we have. On your, on your comment on air service, what part of this visioning process is talking with you and talking about to the community about what level of air service we want? Do we want to maintain the current level of air service that we have? Is that important to us as a value? Um, Rich, I'm going to come over here, this gentleman here, and then Jackie. Thanks, Richard Heady with the Technical Working Group. And I won't ask my first question about who has rights to increase or set landing fees, but uh, let me ask us the other question. For you, Greg, I assume the FAA has jurisdiction over fuel specifications sold at the Aspen Airport, and does the local sponsor have any obligations, or any rights, I should say, to request, for example, the availability of lower carbon fuel or higher renewable energy fuels sold at this airport? The, the FAA does uh, govern the, uh, has safety requirements for fuel farms and, and fuel flowage. As for the fuel itself, uh, I think that would be an external uh, factor, meaning that it would not come from within the FAA, but maybe come from an administration or come from Congress uh, with respect to uh, different type of fuels. If the, if the manufacturer is going to employ biofuels and the airline said that we, that's fine with us and it, it will be fine with the FAA if, it, if it's gonna be a safe, uh, but uh, I don't think that going to, other f I don't think that the airport sponsor can say, okay, we want a different fuel uh, mix, if I'm understanding your, your question correctly. I don't think that would be the airport sponsor could do that. Well, but, so, sorry, I keep asking questions. I'm learning right along with <laughs> you guys. But um, as, as the airport sponsor, we put out to bid and we contract and, and lease for the fixed based operator. Um, would it be within our jurisdiction to give preference to a provider who was providing fuels that were safe but um, had environmental benefits that we wanted to see? Well, it will want to assume that those fuels have been established to be safe for that particular Absolutely. aircraft. Uh, still, I'm a bit wary of, of saying that the FAA would be okay with with that sort of uh, incentive or is that, that if, it, if all else is equal, mm -hmm. I th still think that it would be, the FAA would leave it to the, uh, the airline or the, air, uh, uh, the operator. Uh, and, and, but again, I, it wouldn't put, put, put it past Congress, uh, an environmentally friendly Congress, or to say, well, we want to favor this type of fuel and therefore we're going to provide these benefits at airports. Just elaborating on that theme, um, I'll just play the scenario out. In the terminal building, do we, as a, as a, a local, uh, the owner, can we provide incentives for, say, for concessionaires who would use, invite, who would... Um, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so definitely that's a within, way we within, could influence within the terminal, yes. In the terminal. That's not an aeronautical activity, so that an airport sponsor has so much more authority and responsibility. That's something the FAA wouldn't control. Right. Um, Rich? 
So my name is Jackie Merrill. I'm on the Vision Committee, and I, I think I'm going to take this emphasis that I've been hearing to a different place because I think of our job as from 30,000 feet up. Oh, okay. So What's your question, Jackie. What I'm asking is because I read that last week the Glenwood Springs Airport had a meeting about its future, I'm thinking how can we act provincially without considering Grand Junction, Rifle, Eagle, and all those county commissioners involved, and how can we think, how can we be presumptuous enough to think that we can work on this airport alone and also serve the needs now and future of the whole valley? And how would the FAA feel about our actually cooperating? In some ways, those airports are our competitors. They develop at our expense or we develop at their expense. We look to the FAA and the master planning process and their aviation planners to take a look at more of the system holistic approach to it. So they take a look at what's happening in Aspen, what's happening in, in throughout uh, Vail, Glenwood, Grand Junction, Colorado Springs. They'll take a look at that whole system they'll actually give priorities and give grants to those airports before they give them to us to address some of the deficiencies that maybe exist in that regional area. So really the oversight of that regional perspective is handled by the FAA, but since it's individual jurisdictional political bodies, um, as Greg, some of his previous slides uh, showed, we're just focused in our particular facility, the best way to operate it in the safest way. Okay, I'm looking for hands. This, um, oh, oh, John McBride, and then and then we'll go to you. Okay. I'm John McBride. I'm on the uh, Vision Committee, and uh, longtime pilot, and work near the airport. Uh, a small question for you first, Greg. I have a grass strip about uh, uh, 100, uh, 1,500 feet long, about 20 miles from here. The tower called me two years ago and said if they had somebody going out having a mechanical problem, could they direct them to me? In which case, would you rep recommend uh, and represent me? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, why? Because, uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> when I teach aviation law, I ask students, uh, law students, how many airfields are there in the United States? The answer is 19,000 plus, because they include your grass strip. Paved, you go down, down way down to a couple thousand, and certificated, you go down to 500 plus. But um, that's something I'd be, I'd be interested in to talk to you about okay. further. <laughs> well, okay. I want to thank you for the emphasis you put on safety, because the FAA has been critiqued seriously after Addis Ababa for not stepping up and passing the ball over to the manufacturers and the airlines, and I hope that's not the case. Otherwise, it would be like having a fox guard the, the hen house. Um, I, there's been a lot of talk about the runway being moved and the strengthening, what have you. I don't think these are factors that make our airport that dangerous. What makes us dangerous is the fact that we are in a, on a high altitude valley very narrow, crosswinds. Um, last weekend, there were 70 flights came in, both Saturday and Sunday. Okay, you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think the real danger is general aviation in this particular situation because of the, si the valley itself and the winds and the fact that you land uphill and take off downhills, you have cross traffic, and then you have general aviation fluttering around trying to mix in. It seems to me to attack safety like you're talking about, the most important thing would be to have higher standards for those pilots who are general aviation flying in, and maybe a much higher landing fee, something that the county could do the, there's f things that so could be question, done to make it safer. Is your question, can we implement higher safety standards for? Yeah, yes. Okay. Well, that would be a, uh, ultimately a decision for the FAA to determine that they're going to require a level of training 
or experience to come into a particular airport. It would not be the airport's decision, but an airport can certainly go to the FAA and say, because of our conditions, we want you to up the experience or training requirements. And the FAA could do that. They probably would not just go with one airport. They might look at a number of them and say, at, at these type of airfields, with these type of conditions, we're going to require a little bit more. Now, the FAA, if it wants to do that, their lawyer, not me anymore, might say, well, you have to go to a rulemaking to do it, and you're looking at two or three years. But where is AOPA, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, where is the National Business Aviation Association, NBA? These organizations have buttressed the safety requirements that the FAA put in place by improving the safety of business aviation and general aviation. Uh, well, workshops, conferences, and they could encourage best practices. If you wanted to impose a requirement, though, you're looking at a rulemaking. Okay, this, um, uh, yep, right here. My name is Valerie Braun, I'm on the Vision Committee, and if we were to recommend to the Board of County Commissioners that we want to upgrade the runway and taxiway uh, to meet the FAA standards for a Group 3 airport, and we make the application, and they're only willing to fund it to 50%, would we be able to continue with the project? I understood you to say that it's up to 90%, it, but we're competing with all of these other safety uh, uh, airports that want to do safety improvements as well. What's the tolerant, what, what would happen if, yeah, we can give you 50% of what you're asking or 30% of what you're asking? Well, that's yeah. really directed to John, but I, I think I want to, answered that first. Yes, it, the FAA has up to 90%. Safety improvements, eligible projects, safety improvements, we would expect the FAA to fund it at 90%. And that is a question that if the local office says, well, I've got other airports to feed, the region, you take it to the region, you take it to headquarters. By the way, that's where I work, Washington, D.C. On safety improvements, we should push hard for the 90%. On others, uh, it, it, it may be a, more of a struggle. The FAA we will uh, <clears throat> program these size projects over a multi-year process. So it'll be a combination of state grants, which are much smaller, two and a half to five percent, FAA at 90 percent, and then as part of airport revenue fees, uh, savings that we have uh, in the uh, savings that we have, as well as passenger facility charges, as well as CFCs, which are customer facility charges, which is basically the exact same thing as uh, airline head tax. You also have head tax for rental cars. So it's a variety of funding mechanisms, and then we also have uh, bonding capability with the revenues at the airport and other creative uh, funding, John, that you could probably speak to better. Uh, what is the phrase that's not bonding, but it's... Certificates of participation. So we have a multitude of funding sources. <coughs> and and Valerie, sources. I think what you're getting at is, uh, I, put, I put the roadmap up here because this is a, a good thing to refer back to. What can we afford? And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna ha have a look at that discussion. Um, in the back here, and then I'm gonna go um, up to, to the front here, and then in the back there, and then, then here. Go. <laughs> Sorry, um, my name is Walter Chi, and I'm on the focus committee a uh, long time pilot in Aspen here and operated out of the airport. Um, I just, the questions for Greg and maybe uh, John as well, of whether or not the regulation that the airport already has in effect, which is a safety regulation requiring operations with, for the pilot to be operating within the last 12 months has to have operated in the Aspen airport as well as being an instrument rated and an instrument rated airplane to fly in. And we have another regulation that says you can't take off on 1-5 unless you've got a letter from the airport uh, director who says you've proved that your aircraft can do this performance, which is not FAA related. Is that not enforceable then because it's a county regulation? Well, the, the, I can answer the, the first part of it. The, the instrument rated the, the within the last 12 months, one takeoff and landing at the airport, that's, that's in law. That's the 1994 uh, provision that I alluded to and that the airport could keep its curfew if it committed to the FAA by November 1, 1994, that it was going to enforce that experience requirement. Okay, we're gonna take next question. Second, second part of the question. Oh, sorry. 
Oh, sorry. Sorry, John, the, go ahead. The uh, runway 15, Walter, that you're talking about, yes, that's still in effect? Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up because that's three aspects that are overlaid on general aviation. That, Yeah, thank you. Anything else on that we should dive into? Uh, my name is Scott Ryder. I'm with the Vision Committee. And I'm curious, I've heard a lot about the safety standards, of course, associated with departures and arrivals in the aircraft. Are there, I've, John gave me a tour of the back of house recently or maybe about a year ago and I found it was pretty deplorable in, in its conditions. Are there safety standards or other sorts of standards that apply to the back of house, the package handling, the areas where the employees work, where they break and all those sorts of things? And second follow-up question, will anyone who's interested be able to go see the conditions of those facilities? Because the, the conditions we put our employees in are pretty bad. That's a great question. Back of house regulation. Well, I, I would say that, so, well, now I'll let you answer this question. I was just asking John if OSHA applied to municipalities, and the answer was no. That was the first thing that, that, that came to mind. But uh, it's really in the tenant leasehold area, and we're relying upon those individuals to have a variety of safety standards, which they all do. Um, but that, uh, that building is just very old. It's very antiquated. Uh, I think we have, would have a difficult time uh, proving that we meet all ADA and NFPA uh, standards with that particular facility. So. Uh, it is uh, it is pretty rough, and if uh, again I extend the invitation, a couple of people have come up to me, so thank you for bringing it up again. Anybody would like a tour, would be happy to show you. Whenever, especially after a snow day, if you want to see it the following day and come out and see the density of people and and uh, some of the challenges that the airlines and the airport are facing in that uh, constrained facility, or just want to come out at any time, we'd be more than happy to take uh, take you out on that tour. So just come up to me, and we'll we'll start making a list. So. Okay, Rich in the back there. My name is Kirk Hinderberger. I'm on the community committee, and I live in the community across the street. I have an environmental question. Uh, I've noticed, uh, especially early in the mornings when there's a lot of congestion, that the pilots will come in early. This is more general aviation corporate. They'll come in early. They'll run the uh, auxiliary power units or the APUs, or they'll just run the engines uh, to keep the planes warm or get them ready. Uh, and this can be for prolonged periods, which causes a lot of uh, exhaust, it also causes a lot of noise for our community. And I was wondering, is it possible for the county to implement restrictions on that, whether it's uh, restricting the amount of time a plane can idle, or uh, requiring electrical hookups, so they don't need to do that, and or force planes to move to, say, the north end of the runway to do that, so it's not impacting the immediate area. And is that something that can be a for or implemented by the county, and could it be overridden by the FAA? Thank you. Does that go to you, Greg? Yeah, I, um, I'd probably want to think more on, on that and get um, uh, get back to you on that. Uh, I don't know if anybody else that wants to take that uh, question. I'll take yeah, <coughs> I'll take one part. Um, the the electrical hookups is, I believe, an infrastructure issue that would require quite a bit of investment in infrastructure. I, I do think that is a technology that, that would be available um, with, with some development, but as far as the regulatory, the preemption question, obviously, yeah. I will defer. I know in the pushback, it, you, they, the pushback at m many large airports is done through a no emission type of vehicle. Uh, I, I just don't know whether that is because the airport has said, we want to do it and the air carriers have no objection or the air carriers have done it on their on their own. Uh, if if the air carriers don't want to do it, uh, I don't know what the FAA would allow an airport to say, this is the way we're going to do it. But I don't know why an air carrier or an operator would not, um, would object to a zero emission uh, pushback. And, and, it's and, not or, the pushback, yeah, it's, it's the, the APU. auxiliary power unit. Yeah. yeah. Can, can we regulate basically? And that's what I don't, I don't know. Those. And I don't know I that. I think that's answer, a really yeah. good question. And I think we need back to do to some follow up. Yeah. Or we'll John? Yeah. Actually, can we get a microphone in the back to Jonathan Jones, who's yeah. the general manager of Atlantic Aviation? He can talk a little bit about some of the ground equipment and the APU factor. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. 
Uh, the APUs aren't allowed to be turned on until after 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, and that is what you're hearing. They, they only turn on the engines when they're ready to go, and then we have GPUs that are quieter that we provide. We supply that to each aircraft, and uh, so there are regulations already in place as far as the, the sounds and everything you're hearing. The airlines hook up to, uh, in a different way sometimes with, with the infrastructure is what John was talking about. But for us, we supply those GPUs to try and keep, there's, there's two reasons, it's easier on the aircraft and it's also, uh, there's less sound, less noise involved in that. So that's some of the things we do in the mornings to, to keep that down. And, and I'd love to get with you and we can talk more about that. And, Come on out to the FBO, and we'll show you what we do to try and keep things as quiet as we can. Okay, um, can you just, a little bit show of hands, we we're going we're gonna to go to um, right here, and then uh, sir, we'll go to you next, and then the gentleman in the blue shirt, you're third, and then I want to make sure we get you here, you've had your hand up too, you're fourth. All right, um, oh, make, I want to make sure I get a fair share, and you're fifth, all right. Um, hi there. My name is Tony Kronberg, and I'm on the Experience Working Committee. And um, the article that was published in the Aspen Daily News today brought out um, when John Kinney was hired, he was basically hired to catch an elephant with a mousetrap. Okay, do you have a question? I do. we got a lot of questions tonight. And it has to do with the terminal. Okay. And that elephant stepped on the mousetrap, and we need to do something about the existing terminal now before the new terminal is built. So this might be a question for John Peacock, so far as the budget, is that John Kinney's recommendation was to take that um, departure, the arrival for the baggage, turn that into a sterile boarding area, put a tent on the outside. So is your question, are there things that we can do now to upgrade the terminal and address some of these issues? That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll do part of it and uh, hand it off to John as well. We're meeting with the airlines here in a few weeks over this exact issue in terms of density of passengers and flights and peaking and what type of improvements can we do short term and medium term until this process is concluded to find out what is, what is going to be the answer. So the, um, those are some of the uh, aspects of it that we're looking at. The airlines pay for those uh, uh, improvements. We front the cost and we charge it back to them through rates and fees. So. Those discussions uh, are in motion, and then we then take that back to the Board of County Commissioners, and we, we're just not there yet. Okay, back here. And as we're in this visioning process, it has been my direction. Um, first, we want to be safe, um, it, whether that means limiting capacity or improving infrastructure. However, we also don't want to make um, huge investments in a facility that we're in a process right now about talking about replacing um, and so we're constantly trying to, to seek that balance and so we're, we're looking at alternatives those would need to be approved by the the Board of Commissioners um, and we are not seeking to increase capacity um, at, at our airport right now we're seeking to make what we have safe okay gentleman here rich uh, yes my name is Phil Holstein and I'm on the tech technical group. Uh, this is uh, for Greg. I want to get a clarification of what you said. Uh, did you say that the FAA will not allow us to keep our current airport and service as it is operating under our FAA approvals as of now? and that they will f uh, demand that we increase our airport to a hub airport or a phase three airport. Uh, uh, and if we do not, they will downgrade us to a, uh, uh, they will not allow us to keep the kind of service that we have now. Is that what you're saying? That's, that is accurate that there is a risk, and it's very hard to quantify that risk, that if the decision is made to stay with the status quo, with the non-standard design group three, that the FA could say, well, then we're going to make it a design group two airport, because those modifications that we have 
so much want you to uh, to improve upon by lengthening the um, excuse me by widening the runway and increasing the distance between the taxiway and the runway. Those are so important to the FA that if we don't do that, uh, it's just unpredictable on this. I don't think that it would be fair if I would not put that on a slide and then that would happen and you say, well, we had this FA expert up here and he didn't, didn't, I don't want to say it's a parade of horrible. It's a possibility. I wouldn't call it a probability. The probability is you losing the, fu the federal funding. I would call it a possibility. Um, right here, we go. Tom Elberk, uh, Vision Committee. What I've been hearing is that there's a lot of uh, air traffic congestion and on and on in the air and on the uh, airport itself. And if we enlarge the airport, it's my understanding we would have at least four more um, routes from the East Coast that would be able to uh, come into Aspen directly. And I'm just wondering how we would accommodate more air traffic that would, we, we'd be inviting more air, air traffic. So is your question, um, does, um, does moving the runway and, and meeting those conditions equal um, having more air service? Correct. Okay. There are times now where <clears throat> you could throw a bowling ball on the ramp and not hit an aircraft. And you throw the bowling ball also throughout the terminal building and not touch a single person. There's times where it's just absolutely vacant. So there is tremendous amount of capacity still left uh, to bring in more operations. Uh, what we find at these <clears throat> our airport is you probably have no fewer than four flights at once all the way up to 11 flights on even on normal operations. You have nine aircraft parked there overnight now, RONs remain overnight. So it's that peaking, it's that rush hour period and then absolute lulls. So there is plenty of capacity left if those uh, schedules of corporate aviation, general aviation, schedule service would just simply flatten it out. So there still is a tremendous amount of capacity but you're, you're seeing uh, peak rush hour periods definitely where uh, you're seeing even delays because there's so much, so many operations trying to take place in that short window. But when Did that answer your question? What? How can we address the congestion? I think, Tom, I, it, it, maybe because uh, I'm not sure everyone can hear you, I think your question really is about airspace, you know, that. Um, we can only accommodate so many operations in a given period of time. And so the, the changes in the geometry, um, would it impact that or, or not, or if you're trying to, to add commercial flights? Is that correct? Okay. And I and think one thing might clarify too is how many gates do we have right now at yeah. the Aspen Airport. So we have seven gates um, right now, so that's got to be part of the conversation uh, that we have over the, the next year, is what is that fleet mix likely to be? That will be um, part of our May discussion, so I think we'll be able to go a little bit deeper then uh, on, on that question. And then what what is the capacity? I think what John's saying is if you have direct flights and you're not needing to make connections, um, you may, the, the airlines may have an opportunity to flatten out that schedule. I think what's um, really a challenge right now is the airport peaks. Sometimes it peaks because we have aircraft that have been grounded from weather events, right? Sometimes it peaks because they're, all the airlines are scheduling to make connections at other hubs. Um, and so that's going to be the question is if you do have um, direct flights, to, are the airlines likely to flatten out that schedule? Um, and then the conversation the community really needs to have is, well, how much capacity do you want to build into to this infrastructure? Does that answer your question a little bit better? This gentleman here in the, in the middle. And then if I could take a couple more hands of folks that have, we'll go to you next, Michael. Hi, I'm Jeff Pate. 
Am I on? Uh, I'm Jeff Bay. I'm with the Experience Committee. Uh, one, on one of your slides, it said that the airport sponsor kind of has some control over, or some lim uh, it can impose some limitations, or what I w would almost perceive as throttling based on parking capacity, terminal capacity, types of gates. I guess my question is, who determines what those capacities are? Is there a universal metric that says for a 10,000 foot terminal you can have X amount of people or for an acre sized parking lot you can have X amount of cars or could we just make the parking spots twice as wide have half as many cars and say we're full how much control locally do we have over those choices I think uh, just taking parking um, that it's if you wanted to have um, uh, parking spaces where two cars can fit, but only one, ba based on the lines. That's that's an airport sponsor would not make that decision because it, you're losing possible revenue from from that. There's not a safety. It, 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 there's not a safety standard that the FAA imposes on parking facilities. Not that I'm not that I'm aware of. So, Mike, I'll, t I'll pass this down to you in just a second so you can kind of describe it from the holistic view of airport planning. There's a variety of metrics out there. So for the calculations inside a terminal building, uh, ticketing area, it's 15 square feet per passenger. Baggage claim, it's 20 feet per passenger square feet. They have more bags than when they're checking in when they arrive. Uh, our correction, it's the same. In the uh, sterile area, it's 15 square feet. So there are different metrics. There's different uh, uh, sizes, envelopes around each one of the gates based on whether you're group two or you're group three. So there are planning metrics, planning tools that you would overlay uh, in just about every dimension out there. So that airfield geometry of 400 feet separation that the FAA so badly wants between the runway and taxiway, there's metrics for every aspect of the airport and the airfield uh, and the terminal building and parking stalls. So, uh, Mike, do you want to add anything to that? I, I would just point out, I mean, we have both our, our terminal planners actually here in the back room, in the room, and he could talk to you a lot about, there's a, a several dozen guidelines, thumb rules, metrics, whatever you want to call them about space. Um, they come out of building codes. They come out of uh, good practice in uh, aviation facilities. Uh, same thing relative to all the civil improvements. You asked parking, parking spaces. Well, um, in, in many communities, th those are actually put into the actual codes. I don't know in your county what the position is, but you would typically follow the standards that you use for parking facilities, um, lay it out in typically the most efficient way you possibly can and go from there. But you have control over how much of that space is dedicated to each of those functions. It becomes a conscious choice that the community, that Pitkin County can make in terms of how we develop this. We're gonna go here, Michael, and Michael, you're next, and then we'll, we'll go right here. Um, and then I'm gonna head back over here. We have some hands over here. Yep, sorry, so sorry. Do you wanna come out, stand over here? Grab the mic, we'll be there in just a minute. Uh, Michael Miracle, I'm on the uh, Community Character Working Group. This is a question for Greg about uh, maximum landing weight. On your slide, on the design category, or the design group three requirements, it says landing weight determined by forecasted fleet mix and number of operations, but then you said that uh, maximum landing weight is less of a concern for the FAA than the uh, runway width and the runway taxiway separation. But when you lower the max landing weight, you, you do start knocking potential planes off, off your list, so it has a discriminatory factor. So I wondered if you could just help us understand how is that maximum landing weight determined and, and when is it viewed as a discriminatory argument and not? Well, I'm, I'm going to probably give Mike that that question on how is it determined. I, I didn't want to suggest that, I only wanted to suggest that if the landing weight, however it's determined, is non-standard for design group three, making it standard for design group three is not as high a priority to the FAA than, than the runway width and the distance between the taxi, and that's all I was trying to say. Oh, you want to go? We're one of the few airports, in fact, the only airport that I'm aware of who uses landing weight. We don't have scales. <laughs> We're unique. Aspen's unique. M Mike will talk about 
takeoff weight, which is the industry norm. Back to your metrics, Jim. Yeah, the, I, I think the landing weight thing came because Pitkin County does have a, in, in ordinance, a landing weight limit. As aviation designers, we're designing pavement strength. And that's what the FAA is really gonna look at. And they're gonna use the fleet mix, looking what wants to be coming and going, and out of that will become a design aircraft. And that design aircraft will have a maximum takeoff weight, and we'll look at the number of operations and the fleet mix. And just like you would design a, ro a roadway in terms of number of, of loads passing over things, that's how we de design pavements for design lifetimes. Um, so at, at the end of the day, the engineering will end up being a frankly, a max takeoff weight based on the design aircraft that comes out of the fleet, the approved fleet mix and, and forecast. And who approves that? Yeah. Hello? Uh, the, uh, the FAA will approve the official forecast. However, it is work that's being done. Um, at, at this point in time, we're starting the, the, that process, um, and we will look at it. And, and certainly the county has an opportunity to look at that and influence that based on what the development that they're going to support in the future. So it's sort of an iterative process. The FAA has to agree to it, uh, but there's a fair amount of latitude to that. Thank you. Um, Evan Marks, um, Focus. The previous master plan um, had a second FBO along Owl Creek, which in the current master plan was eliminated. Is there not a sufficient room along the north side of the airport, along 82, to permit a second FBO? So are you saying two FBOs on the same side that right up against Highway 82? Um, no, I don't think there is. We, we have some constraints presently um, with airfield geometry down there, taxiways versus taxi lanes, and. A uh, taxi lane is less than a taxiway. It really should be a taxiway and not a taxi lane. I know that's probably sounding like mumbo jumbo, but again, it all gets back to metrics and very specific um, operational areas. So we have a lot of operational restrictions down there uh, based on we don't have a lot of room. So if we were more of a rectangular shape, possibly, but to have a, that, uh, a second FBO on that side of the airfield, uh, we, we don't have the space to do so. And just, just one clarification. The current airport layout plan still does have a west side FBO and west side taxiway. It was not part of the environmental assessment because there was no funding in the foreseeable future for development of that infrastructure. Um, and, and the EAs, once you have a finding of no significant impact, have a timeline that you need to act on those for them to, to remain valid. Um, but the opportunity here is really based on the conversations we're having with you as a community representative, as the community representatives, is to relook at that airport layout plan. Okay, in the back. Yeah. Mike Waters, uh, Technical Committee. Um, has anybody really, has anybody from the uh, FAA, I guess it would be the Aeronautical Information uh, Service, looked at what approaches would look like, according to TERPS, if you move the runway over 80 feet? <coughs> I was having a little difficulty time hearing, but you're basically saying the approach based on the, the new runway alignment yeah, if it was approach. to move over 80 feet? Right. Yes, yeah. that, uh, that was circulated through the different uh, branches within the FAA, so air traffic control did take a look at the arrivals and departure paths and the associated obstructions, whether it be the cliffs or further out mountains. Uh, the RAND Corporation also did a study on, on that area as well, so the FAA has blessed the approach and arrival departure procedures if that runway's moved over 80 feet to the west. Uh, the question is about changing the procedures. Would it change the procedures? Oh, I'm so sorry. Would we change right? the procedures? I'm sorry, Mike, I can't hear you. Grab a microphone. Follow well, up, sorry, I yeah. couldn't quite hear you. I can't hear you yeah. with the microphone, so forget okay. the other. Okay, <laughs> so yes, I know it would change the procedures. 
um, are those procedures, those new procedures available for pilots to look at? I don't know. I don't think they are, but that would be a question for the FAA, so we, we can find out for you. Yeah, because that relates directly to safety and reliability. Okay, I'm going to a little bit take the temperature of the room. We, we've got about 10 minutes until 7 o'clock this evening, and I just want to make sure that everyone had a chance to, to speak their mind tonight. Is there anyone else that would like to, um, I, any other hands out there? Okay, one in the back. And then that will be the last, or two, two over here. Okay, this one and then this one, and then we'll maybe take one more, and then I'd like to go down the panel with just kind of final thoughts. All right, Kirk from Community again. Number one, can the county restrict the total amount of flights and or passengers in and or out of the airport and or incentivize spreading out the flights through cha charging different rates at different times based on demand? Okay, that was about, can, I, we couldn't quite hear you. If you could just speak real clearly and loudly so everybody could hear. Can the county or the airport restrict the total quantity of flights or passengers coming in or out and or incentivize when those flights are done based on different charges or fees based on demand? Uh, the answer to the first question is no. On, on incentive fee structures, uh, the FAA has allowed for peak period pricing at congested airports. Uh, this is a change in the FAA's philosophy over many years. They, that change was made 10 or 15 years ago. You, but the, the FAA would need to find that the airport is congested. And of course, it doesn't have to be congested 24-7. And then the airport would say, propose a peak period pricing system to the FAA. And the FAA could approve it if it's not found to be discriminatory or unreasonable. So peak period pricing based on a congested airfield is is a, a, a question that the FAA is willing to tackle. Okay, we had another question in back here. Hi, my name is Wayne Etheridge. I'm with the uh, Character Committee. Uh, my question is um, having to do with constraints on operations, landings, and takeoffs. Is the configuration of the runway and taxiway a greater limitation than the airspace limitation currently? I can't calculate it. I don't know. But Is that what do you ask? So just to repeat the question, you're, we've acknowledged that we're constrained. And so, Wayne, your question is, is the airspace a bigger constraint or the infrastructure on the ground a bigger constraint? Is that right? Essentially, or are they equal? Are, or are they equal? I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but I do know that we have the person who can model that and, and determine that. Um, in fact, she will be here in, in the May meeting as well, though she won't have a model done. Um, I, I think of the ge geometric issues right now from the FAA being a more safety, safety clearances uh, concern of theirs as opposed to how, how things operate. And certainly, your head-in operation is very limiting to the, to the airport, so my, my guess is that it's not going to be the ground side, but um, we, we can ask, certainly ask Elizabeth to validate that. Okay. Rich, there's one more. Is there another question in the back? Yes, right here. If it's okay with you, you'll be the final question. Hi, my name is Elijah Goldman. I'm with the Focus Group. And so I was, I'm basically wondering, we're talking about constraints having to do with um, airspace so when we or if we expand the airport and we're able to land aircraft that are larger with larger capacities even though we're flying more routes could that help offset the amount of aircraft coming in because they wouldn't have to fly as many routes per day thanks for that question elijah Good um question. I, we all may take a crack at this but um, I, I have said in several meetings that I don't think anyone flies in here to see our airport. I, I think people fly in here uh, to enjoy the mountains, to enjoy our community, um, and, and the amenities um, that, that are here. And so I think that the number of people coming in aren't necessarily related to the infrastructure. And so if that is right, 
and I think there's a legitimate argument about whether that's correct or not. Um, your math would be correct. If you have airplanes with larger capacity, you may have fewer operations. However, on the other hand, I, I think there's a legitimate question out there that if you have um, larger airplanes and, and increased capacity, you're going to have more people um, coming into the, to the community. I, I don't know. We, we are going to be having a build-out um, analysis as part of our May meeting. Is that right, Mike, or is that later in the process? Yeah. We're, we're going to be doing some build-out analysis to look at um, development and capacities and potential future build-out so we can better understand what that demand might be and, and what it might mean for the airport in the future. Um, I'm sorry, more into July. Um, the people who are doing the work are reminding me. Okay, did anyone else want to comment on that? That's a really good question. Okay, so I think what we'll do is we'll just go down the panel and just want to leave everyone with some final thoughts um, as it relates to the objective, as, as Meg said. You know, going back to that, those objectives for the evening, um, uh, going back to what um, John Bennett left us with about um, vision follows values. So let's just go down the panel with some final thoughts, and then if everyone could sort of just stay tuned. You didn't get a chance to meet with your group tonight, but um, I think we're going to have a meeting in, in April that we'll be able to get together. So um, John Kenny, do you want to kick us off on kind of final thoughts? Thanks for your participation. Uh, we're trying to be as honest and transparent as possible on your questions. If we don't answer those, please circle back with us. Um, there's going to be decisions made at the airport between now and the next five to seven years, even if you push the go button tomorrow, and make it at the end of your process would be January of next year. It's going to be three to five years before anything is, is built. Between now and those five year period, we have to operate the airport safely. So uh, anticipate that into your thought process as well and ask us questions and, and understand those issues uh, too. Uh, we can operate the airport just as easily, small, medium, or large, or anything in between. But the biggest thing that I hope that you get out of this process is that any decision you bring forward, you will fully understand the ramifications of intended and unintended consequences so that you are very comfortable with that decision 10, 15, 20, 25 years down the road. So your questions during this process, I think, will get you to that. But that, that is uh, my hope out of this process of, of uh, what you derive from it. And I would just add that um, oh, you saw me here tonight. I'm not going away. Yeah, I'm going back to Washington, D.C. tomorrow. But uh, I do want to help answer questions. and if. There were answers given tonight, and some of you said, well, I'm not really sure what he means, and you didn't have the opportunity to, to ask the question before we, we call, called it quits. Um, I'll be there to um, help answer those questions going forward. You all just sat through a three-hour <laughs> meeting on federal preemption. If that's not a sign of community <laughs> dedication, I don't know what is. So, First, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, again for, for being here. Um, I want to echo also what, what Greg says. My wife reminds me I'm slow but trainable, and every time I leave a meeting like this, I'm like, why didn't I ask that? If that happens to you, email us. We will try and answer that question. I think it's up here. Is e that email right? us at info at ASEvision.com. That goes directly to the entire project team. Um, and we, we, we collate. I have the master list up here if anybody wants to check yeah. off to see if there are questions on it. And then the, the thing I hope we're taking away from tonight is, yeah, we're preempted in certain areas, but not in all areas. And as a local community, it allows us to explore some yes and uh, types of solutions. And I, I hope that we can um, as our, our visioning team uh, leaders encouraged us to do at, at the beginning of the meeting um, is, is to really try and be imaginative, work together, and, and not waste this opportunity to, to build a, a creative solution that 
best serves our community. So thank you for being here. Well, I'll just echo the thanks. Um, as, as the manager of the program management team, our, our job and our desire is to give you the information to understand the trade-offs and the opportunities you have. It's your decision to make, not ours, certainly not mine. We are looking to make sure that you understand what your options are and what, what, what ramifications those decisions have. And at the end of the day, that, that's the right decision for Aspen, and we'll help you manage going through that process. So we look forward to that. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This has been highly educational. What did you guys think? Educational? Yeah. Pretty, pretty great. Uh, if you could leave your name tag out on the table, too, that would help us. Um, stay tuned. Follow your email. Reach out. There is more visioning to come. Thank you so much.